any given week, we're doing good just to get a few things done on our to-do list. It just seems like there's more expectation than there is time in the day. And often the last thing that we focus on is soul care. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast. For the next two weeks, we are going to take you on a journey into soul care. Now, this conversation originally aired in 2016, and Craig and I are discussing ways to make space for our soul, how to have a heart that stays alive as we face all of the craziness of the world that we find ourselves in. Craig didn't know it at the time. None of us did. But this was one of the last podcast series that he would record with Ransomed Heart. And this just shows you the depth of his passion for God, the commitment to soul care in the hardest times of his life. Now, here's Craig talking about soul care. This is Craig McConnell, and I'm with Alan Arnold, and welcome you to the Ransom Heart Podcast today. It happens to be spring in Colorado, which means one day is beautifully sunny in the uh, 70s and just gorgeously warm, and then we get what? foot and half of snow. A few feet of snow yeah. shoveling our driveways. Right. John years ago told me there's no spring in Colorado. It's a uh, battle between winter and summer. Well, usually every Mother's Day here, it snows. And mm-hmm. so we probably have another one a few weeks away. Uh, yeah, we got a few. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not think about that. Okay. So here's the best way not to think about that, Craig. <laughs> you just got back from a trip yes. recently and it was not snowy at all there, right? It was... Not a bit. Tropical paradise. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. Listeners. Oh, my gosh. How much Lori and I just needed some beauty, some adventure, some really rich fellowship, a vacation, really, but more than vacation, renewal, refreshment. It felt like just soul care. Mm -hmm. In a really, really deep way. And it also felt like just the beginning. But Lori and I were invited to join two other couples sailing through the British Virgin Island. Wow. And it was a gift to us that oh, was just a, a stake in the ground memory of uh, such wonderful time. But yeah, so we were sailing the British Virgin Islands, retracing the the path of many a pirate. <laughs> I have this image of you in your sailor's cap and the uh, pipe out of your mouth at the front of the ship just yeah, yeah. commanding. I was yeah, the masthead. Great authority. Right. Yeah. The masthead. <laughs> Arg. <laughs> so how long had that trip been in the planning stage? Only uh, a couple of months. It was sprung on us, short notice really, as a gift. And Lori and I haven't really had a a vacation per se for a while. We've been distracted with doing the cancer thing. But And for listeners who don't know this, you and Laurie have traveled a lot together in the last several years, but almost all of those trips. Exclusively to Houston. To MD Anderson. Yeah. Right. So the traveling didn't connote rest or replenishment. It was trying to get healing for something that was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first time the two of you have actually been packing your luggage and planning for a trip of joy. Yeah, this is the first trip. We didn't have a modium in the suitcase and, Mm. you know, all the paraphernalia you need. But, yeah, so we flew to um, Tortola in the British Virgin Islands, and we boarded this beautiful boat. And I've never sailed really before and certainly not for nine days and met a couple and we knew the other couple and so the six of us were on this boat i'm probably not referring to it right what the what's boat? the difference between a boat and a ship price size well a ship can hold a few thousand people okay right well, then this but was a boat had, yeah but see, we had a dinghy and i wasn't sure you know <laughs> it had an anchor yeah <laughs> 
So you're on this boat with Lori and these two other couples for a week and a half? Nine days. Nine days. And describe, like, what was the rhythm of the days there? Yeah. There is something wonderful about the ocean that my wife introduced me to when we were first married. I remember my asking her what she enjoyed about the beach, the ocean, so much. And she said that the view has never changed. You mm. know, the color of the water from pollution in some areas may have changed the color and so on. But that ocean's pretty much uh, the way it's been since God created it. And it just captures her mm. with a kind of a transcendence. So the routine was rise with the sun. We had set aside our watches, so I have no idea what time that was. And usually the morning, just quiet, the three couples just uh, loving God and living in this message, just honored and respected one another really well. And that would be time with God, prayer, journaling, or just stillness. And then we would sail a couple of hours, or if we were just staying put for another night, we'd uh, just relax and have some prayer, some conversation, eat a little something. And then and then it was just joy, jumping in the water, snorkeling, swimming. It was wonderful. And there was something about, Alan, there's something about the water that was just so therapeutic and just, just so simple. What was phenomenal was it was so salty, I floated. <laughs> that must have been really salty. <laughs> Arg. Uh, it was. I jump in the water and kind of be in a vertical position, and my feet would just naturally come up, and my toes would extend above the water line. And that just doesn't happen without a whole lot of effort, usually. So I was floating. That's and, cool. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And I would put on the mask and the snorkel and just float. No effort, no swimming, just float. And it felt like hours of just of just floating and looking mm -hmm. at fish and seagrass and shells and beautiful little gravel and the in and out of the tide and and I did see one Weber barbecue top uh, on the floating bottom. Floating by? Yeah. No, it wasn't <laughs> oh, floating. It was down there. <laughs> down low. <laughs> well, yeah, you were telling me about earlier this experience where you would just find this cove where you were in the water and the tide would kind of pull you out a little yeah. bit. But then you'd be right back. And Yeah. Here's the beauty of it is, yeah, I went to this reef, not a coral reef, just a sand reef. I was in probably 12 inches of water. Well, make that 18 because I was covered. Uh, <laughs> but I was just in the water. And the movement, the movement back and forth. And I was just looking at the sand and the shells. And there was a little shelf next to me. And I'm convinced that there were great white sharks and moray eels and all kinds of things that could harm me in there. But... You know, being the courageous, almost superhero. Warrior. Type. Yeah. Sea warrior. Yes. I, I had no fear. <laughs> and there'd be this little school of fish that would gather around me. I, I think when I got out, there were about 15 pilot fish attached to me because I was in so long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was just taking it in. And what was really great is that at one point, I'm just floating. I'm just a buoy in the ocean, a bottle with a message in it, just floating. And I had this incredible sense of Christ right next to me snorkeling. And uh, he said, and this was surprising, so you want to break that agreement? You know, I'm in the water. I'm snorkeling. I'm, you know, this kind of feels like an odd time for God to show up. Right. Right. But he shows up and he says, you want to break that agreement? And I'm all, uh, what agreement? And he says, that godless agreement you've made. Now, he said it in a fathering way, which was both disruptively disturbing and so kind, so fatherly, pulling me aside and 
touching something very deep and, and pretty dark. The agreement you've made, Craig, through this cancer journey to want to control how it ends, mm. uh, to control my story, my insisting that this story end the way I want it to, the story being my life, my future. And, and which is how? Like, what had your agreement been? You wanted it to end in what way? I wanted to control it. I wanted to write it. I knew how I wanted the story to go. And it was either super glorious healing and the restoration of everything lost, stolen, and taken and diminished, and kind of a glorious shooting star that just just flares bright across the sky and then poof, is gone. And the emphasis on poof being <laughs> fast. Or just end it all. And that sounds suicidal. I wasn't, and I'm not. But just, you know, just wanting to avoid more pain, more suffering, to either live full or not live at all. But the key was me insisting right. and wanting to write the story and kind of an attitude of giving God instructions on, uh, okay, this is a good day and I want it to go this way and kind of an insistence that life, my story, go as I want. So there I am snorkeling and repenting of playing God in my own life and rejecting yes. a confidence and a trust that God is good and the story I'm in is good and that it's glorious and it's to be lived and enjoyed and to be embraced and however it goes, you know. It's well in my soul. He's awesome. He's Lord God. He is good. And I strayed from that and got confronted snorkeling with that agreement and broke it and repented. And then kind of once again for, I don't know which time, just said, Lord, you're Lord of my life. You're the author of this story. Mm -hmm. I give it to you. However it goes, I surrender. I'm done trying to manipulate, trying to control and orchestrate. I give my life and my story to you. Well, and I love, Craig, how that happened in the sea because it's like God is, as a father, as you said, he's lovingly inviting you into uncharted waters. Hmm. And it's messier because... You don't know when you relinquish control, which we don't really have anyway. Right. But when we relinquish the illusion of control, it does feel messier, riskier. And yet it really is where our stories become far more exciting, far more interesting, because we tend to script it in such a small story way. Yeah. So I love hearing how God came for you in the water, in this way, in that setting as a good father and yeah. invited you into something even greater, even more. Yeah. In, in some way, you know, when I say vacation, you think rest. Yes. You think getting away from it all. And, and it was all of that. But there was something very renewing. And I needed, I needed to see that. I needed to see this wrestling with God over my story. And it felt more like relief to see it and turn it over to him. I'm convinced that what God exposes, he's committing to heal or to come through to speak to or address it. When the enemy exposes things, it's to condemn us. It's right. uh, shame and contempt. And I'm in the water and I'm feeling... Like, wow, God, thank you. I mean, how you care for me. You arrange this trip, and there's something about the beauty and the ocean, the waves, the tropical breeze, the smell of salt floating without effort. This is all part of it. And you're in this, and, you, um, and you're calling me out in some really beautiful way that's not condemnation or shame. It's truly sin. And you hear my confession. You see my repentance. And it's just so good to turn this over to you. 
It's so cool, Craig, that you didn't have to orchestrate this trip. Like it had been years since you and Lori had done any kind of adventure into joy, certainly not across the world. And here you are being invited into something that you didn't have to plan. You didn't have to gin up. um, And then God comes to you in that in a way that further frees you. Like you, you don't. You don't have to make something happen. You don't have to control your story. You don't have to strive for some outcome. It feels like an invitation into Mm -hmm. so much freedom Mm -hmm. and just open handedness of walk with God into Mm -hmm. this beautiful new part of your story. Yeah. I think what I'd want to say is that we need times of rest and get away and Sometimes we can script it and sometimes we can't. But what I believe is that God cares so much about the state of our heart and our soul that he will orchestrate events, circumstances for us to find all we need in him to face and live with joy all we face. And he's such a good father. He's taking care of me. And I know he's good. And I love, I feel like uh, one of the Proverbs, I love the discipline of the Lord. Yes. Well, and what we're hitting on here, although we're talking about a specific moment and trip, Craig, with you, is really how to live a life with soul care, how to bring rest and joy to our soul, whether we're on a trip like you are, or whether we're in the, the dailiness yes. of our life. Because even though you had that trip, you're back in the dailiness now of life here. And so what I'd like to do, if you're good with this, Craig, is pause here because we want to talk to listeners and just each other about how do we care for our soul on a regular basis in the dailiness as well as on those once-in-a-lifetime beautiful trips that Mm -hmm. that we get invited into. Mm -hmm. And so what we'll do, listeners, is we'll come back next week. Pause for now. But the question we'd like to leave you with is, how do you care for your soul? Mm -hmm. So think about that. Spend some time with God in that. Maybe ask your spouse if they know when they watch you, When your soul is dry, what do you tend to do? Where do you tend to go with that? And how do you bring life back into your soul? And then we'll pick up the conversation next week. Super. I'm Alan Arnold. This is Craig McConnell. Thank you for listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast. We'll continue the conversation next week.